Wow, it's really quiet in here. That really was a great film. Um, uh, Mom, I'm David Van Zant, the president here at the New School, and it's, it's great to have you here. It's also, uh, we're really honored to have Abigail Disney uh, return. She was a 2014 recipient of an honorary degree from the New School. Uh, she's really an amazing person, a creative force. Um, her work really resonates strongly, I think, with New School, new school values. You know, we're committed to preparing our students to, to, through creativity, knowledge, and skills to make the world really a better place, uh, to know how to solve really knotty, complex problems, and this is certainly, this is certainly one of them, uh, and also to engage, uh, engage with the world around them. Um, I think also the film exemplifies another very important principle uh, of the New School, which is uh, was our religion, the original founding impetus for the New School was free and open intellectual discourse about controversial issues. And I think if that documentary shows you one thing, it shows you how, um, you know, how blind people can be uh, sometimes and not willing to have an open discussion about important issues. Um, so tonight we hope to have a very respectful conversation about firearms uh, and community safety and the value of human life. Uh, and we invite you uh, as participants in this, we have mics uh, up here, um, to come and share your perspectives in ways that others can hear and understand you and listen also Listen with the uh, intention of understanding others, even with, with those with whom you, with whom you disagree. Uh, our goal is not tonight to debate or critique the film, but rather to use the film as a springboard for conversations that will deep or, deepen our reflections about this, particularly, uh, this particular difficult, uh, very difficult issue. So without more, let me um, introduce um, uh, Abigail Disney. She's an award-winning award filmmaker and philanthropist. She is the CEO and president of Fork Filmed. Um, and an active supporter, come on up, come on, uh, of peace building. The founder and president of. <laughs> Good to see you. She didn't let me finish all this wonderful stuff, but um, uh, she is the founder and president of Peace is Loud, a nonprofit that uses media and live events to highlight stories of women stepping up for peace and resisting violence in their communities. And she is passionate about advancing women's roles in the public. Um, her 20 plus films and series focus on social issues, spotlighting extraordinary people um, who speak truth to power. Great to have you with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to now introduce James Burnett, who's gonna serve as our moderator. Um, he is the editorial uh, director and managing director of The Trace, a non nonprofit journalism setup, uh, a startup covering America's gun violence crisis. He previously served as story editor at the New Republic, a news editor for um, for New York, and a top editor of Boston uh, Boston Magazine. Um, he's the winner of the National Magazine Award for a single topic issue. He studied public policy at Duke University. So it's great to have you with us as well, uh, James. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you here. All right, do you have mics, sir? Do are you already yeah. lavaliered? Okay. Well, let me turn it over to you, and, and let's enjoy. Great. Um, so I wanted to ask you first, uh, um, or to get you to talk a little bit about that first meeting you had mm -hmm. um, with Reverend Shank, which will take us behind the scenes a little bit. Um, I think you've noted, and I'm quoting here, that he, this was someone who'd spent a lifetime fighting with all his heart and soul on the opposite side of every social issue you believed in, most notably abortion. I think you said you had friends who viewed him as the devil, yeah. if I'm, I'm quoting again. I still do. So this is a charge. Uh, dynamic from the get-go. Um, talk to me just a little bit about how you came to seek him out mm -hmm. and how that, that first conversation went. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was weird, was the first meeting. <laughs> um, yeah, I went, I went really on the hunt for a conservative who would talk to me because um, I was raised in a very conservative family, so um, there was a lot of fighting, you know, at a certain point when I started to kind of move away from my parents' political values. And the argument I would always have with my mom was, you know, I'm not doing what I'm doing because I reject your values. Actually, I do what I do because I embrace them. Um, we just have different ideas about how that, what that asks of us. Um, and so when I would look at the NRA, and think about their values, I, those strike me as radical values. Those are socially destabilizing radical values, um, not conservative values as I understood them. So I wanted to challenge conservatives 
um, on that issue, and particularly pro-life conservatives, because if you're going to you know, make your stock and trade the language about the sanctity of human life, then I really need you to answer some questions for me. So he was actually the fifth person I talked to. I went looking deliberately, which is hard to do because we're such a divided country. You can't just pick up the phone and call a right-wing person. You don't know right. anybody. And you don't know anybody who knows anybody. Um, so it, it really did take some work. I went back to the Disney company, actually, and asked them who they worked with to promote Narnia. That was one way I did it. And so hmm. all kinds of different ins and outs. And then finally, I landed um, at, in all of the people I talked to said, when I said to them, I always boiled it down to stand your ground law. Just so you know about standing your ground law, you always had the right to self-defense. You always had the right to take a life in self-defense. Standing your ground laws did not give you that right. The Magna Carta gave you that right. What, the, what standing your ground laws did was relieve you of an obligation to retreat from the conflict before it came to that. And it seemed to me that's the state saying, we now have decided there are worse outcomes than a dead body. And, and I don't know when that happened. That's not the country I'm living in. And if you are, in fact, valuing the sacredness of human life, that should, that should be a point at which you want to stop the conversation. Um, and so I would go, I would lead with that with them. They all said the same four things. They said, you're absolutely right. I've never thought about it before. We have a big problem. And no, I won't work with you because it'll ruin my life. Um, and Rob was the only person who said, it will ruin my life, but I don't know how I can pretend I don't know this anymore. So, so when we sat down for the first time across the table from each other, I mean, the body language was like we couldn't have sat further away from each other in this room if we tried, you know. Um, he, he was, as, it was funny, he was as afraid of me as I was afraid of him. I was expecting horns in a pitchfork. He was expecting horns in a pitchfork. Right. Um, I said, look, you know, we've Googled each other. We could really, really fight if we wanted to, or we could just make a conscious decision to take this one issue and put it over here. And that's not that we're never going to talk about it, but let's just not talk about it now. And let's, as an experiment, find out if there's common ground and then just choose to inhabit that and just explore it. So he agreed to the film it seems before before his while well, his own thinking on the issue was still evolving yeah, his um, own and thinking, yeah. grants you access mm -hmm. before he's really public with this um, yeah. and was there a point at which he said you know if I change my mind um, or was it once he was in it was that was it you know um, he yeah he definitely had points where he would just stop answering my phone calls and returning my messages and I know he was really regretting signing the release. I asked him later, you signed the release right away because you knew you would chicken out and you wanted to make sure you didn't chicken mm -hmm. out. He said, yeah, absolutely. So he signed the release really quickly. Then he would go underground for periods of time. I mean, when I think about the courage of a person who is willing to evolve on camera, that's a profoundly courageous thing to do. And really, when I came to him, it was an issue he just had not thought about at all. Um, it, when I, what I brought up with him troubled him, but that was as much as his thinking was. He didn't think the NRA was a problem. He didn't think the answers were going to be legislative. You know, he didn't think the church had any role in it. So, you know, he has come a long way, and, and he's even continued to evolve after this film is finished. He's really, in many ways, walking away from his pro-life work. He's walking away from most of his community. It's, he's in a, on a terrifying road. Well, and I had a question about that. He is, um, Faith and Action is an organization he founded and so that he controls, but I imagine is reliant on donors and other, um, on financial, mm -hmm. external financial support mm -hmm. um, that I imagine was placed in peril right. with this right. decision. You know, in the, in the back of my head, I, you know, this, this um, chord is so dissonant you know, the relationship between what we say about guns and what we say about life in the evangelical world, we meaning people in general, um, it's just so not a good fit. 
um, you have to do, you know, the, I always know that like when my, my kids come to me and tell me what they were doing Saturday night and takes more than three sentences, I know they're lying, <laughs> right? Right. The longer it takes to explain something, the more you know somebody's just not telling you the truth. And that's what you hear when these people kind of go through all these rehearsed arguments. So I knew there had to be people there who hadn't spoken but were troubled and who would rise to um, the idea that someone was speaking it and, and come out of the woodwork. And that's kind of what's happened. So he had every expectation of losing every donor he had. Um, and he's lost half of them. And that, incredibly, is really encouraging because the half that are, that are still with him are really still with him. They're saying, thank God you've taken this on there's a problem and we can't pretend it's not there anymore. And, and we've been, since the film came out, we've been traveling, we turn out to have this really great dog and pony show and we meet with pastors um, and every pastor's wife, every pastor's wife mm. is so thankful and so with us. Um, what is it, this old, if we want to venture into this, the, there is a gender dynamic, perhaps. Mm -hmm. That's very oh. dicey to get into. Yeah, but not dicey even for me. Um, yes. <laughs> but you said it. The pastor's wife says, mm -hmm. thank you. Exactly. I was trying to get him yeah. you know, to realize exactly. or embrace this. Yeah. Um, what drives that? Um, so I've been calling this a stealth women's film since I started it, um, because I grew up with conservative mother, Phyllis Schlafly, basically. <laughs> not really, but pretty much. Um, and one thing I know about conservative women is they don't listen to women. Um, they need a man to talk to them about the important issues. And so I, I, while I knew there, there would be a real readiness to talk about this among women, that's what my many years of experience working in women's issues was telling me. Um, even if I had no relationship with conservative women, I just knew it, knew it, knew it. Um, but I knew I would need a male surrogate to speak. And, um, and sure enough, and, and I found the, the girliest minister I could find. I mean, he really is very relational mm -hmm. um, in the way he, and he's a, I call him a radical listener. I've never really met a person with better listening skills. Um, and he really makes people trust him. So it, everywhere we've gone, the women are with us before we even open our mouths. And everybody under 30 is with us, everybody, no matter how conservative. Yeah. No matter how conservative. No matter how conservative. That's interesting. Um, there's something that he says at the beginning of the film um, that I wonder how much you see as, a, as the key to his thinking. You say when you approach him at first, he hasn't given the issue much mm -hmm. thought. Um, but he is also someone who, through his anti-abortion activism, mm -hmm. has been part of a movement that, as he describes, takes a turn. And then we have the, abor the shootings of abortion right. doctors. Right. And he says that people under his pastoral care Mm -hmm. were capable of that kind of violence that he himself, if he really pushed himself, right. might be. Can you talk a little bit about how you think that informs his view of human nature and how mm -hmm. that squares with this sort of yeah. idea that there are good people and bad yeah. people? Yeah, I, I think it's one of his strengths as a minister that he's really good at taking a theological point and, and making it a very personal point. Um, because that's really a theological issue, particularly for evangelicals who were primarily Lutherans and Calvinists, who believe very deeply in, in the idea that we are bad, bad people. We are fallen, and the world is fallen, and the devil is alive and well and moving among us. And when the evangelical movement is its worst, it's very focused on all the ways everybody else is bad. Um, but it it really is, Luther was calling us to say, oh, I'm fallen, how can I be a better person? And, and that's what he's trying to kind of bring back, and that's why it's very important to him, and he says it a lot in a lot of audiences. He's like, I'm capable of this, you're capable of this. We all need to ask ourselves, you know, how are we going to be redeemed if we can't even acknowledge the extent to which we as individual people are fallen? It's striking because I, I think we tend to view the issue often as a political one, mm -hmm. as an ideological one, and the film frames it differently as a moral one, as a yeah. spiritual one. Um, and I think it raises a question that I'll ask you to address of how much of that change in framework, that realization that we all have mm -hmm. good and bad, that we're all fallible, mm -hmm. how much that, of that conversation and, and potential for change can happen in a secular space? 
Yeah. And how a, yeah. overall, how key is someone like Rob Shank yeah. to the issue of gun reform yeah. more generally, given mm -hmm. how this, yeah. you know, this fundamental, how do you view yeah. humanity? I mean, I mean, the, this is one of the most religious countries in the world, interestingly enough, even as, co say, compared against Europe. Um, we still have an enormous number of people who self-identify as religious, even though, you know, the, especially evangelicals are hemorrhaging membership. Um, every important social movement in this country has had one foot, at least, in the church. Um, and its best voices, and then I'm not just obviously talking about Martin Luther King, but I'm talking about Dorothy Day. And, you know, Rob talks about the role that ministers played in what we call the Wild West. You know, a lot of the taming of those spaces came because ministers came, set up churches, and and you know, kind of re reminded people who they were. And uh, so, I think that as secular a space as we are, generally speaking, um, and and we do like to keep our politics secular, and I think that's right and appropriate. Who we bring to the debate when we come to the debate, what of ourselves do we bring? That determines the debate, and so that's the right place for the religious institutions to be challenging you um, to, to really be thinking about what in fact your values are and what you're willing to sacrifice in the name of those values. And, and so that, that is where, you know, on Sunday or Friday or, you know, every day of the week, um, you need leaders who are really thinking um, who are helping you think about how to approach these issues. Then you go forth as a voter, then you go forth as a citizen. And, and that's, the leadership has been, the, the, the religious community has been totally silent on what strikes me as a profoundly spiritual issue. Um, I think there's maybe a related dynamic that comes up that if given the importance of religious movements to social movements, mm -hmm. movements for social change, given the fact that the gun violence prevention movement has historically been rooted on the progressive side of the spectrum, how much does this then, and, and does Reverend, Tra Reverend Schrank and his whole resume, um, and both what he has been individually involved in and what he may represent to some progressives, how much does that pose a test of tolerance for folks on the left? Yeah, it, it, it's a huge test of tolerance. I mean, you guys all stayed, thank you. <laughs> but some people leave. Some people cannot tolerate him. People walk out of the yeah, film. Yeah, so there, there are definitely, um, it's, it's too challenging for some people. I have taken a lot of grief from liberals, um, and particularly my feminist friends who think I let him off the hook too easily, too quickly, and I kind of do, um, because his role there in Buffalo was really awful, was really reprehensible. Um, but I don't think it's my place to have him on a hook. We don't get to have each other on a hook. That's not how this works. <laughs> I'm not above anybody. And, uh, and so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put him on trial for his values. That's not my place. Um, so yeah, we all have a lot of work to do. The Moms Demand Action, one of their offices, Lucy um, walked with Rob at last year's March for Life in Washington. And uh, she's, as she says, she's pro-choice, um, but she did because if you're marching for life, why aren't we talking about guns? And Rob gave a very courageous speech in front of all his colleagues there. Um, and uh, the office in South Carolina got wind of the fact that Lucy had marched with him and basically they all quit. Um, so uh, I understand there are certain bottom line values that we have to hold and things that we have to defend. I'm the last person to tell you that it doesn't matter whether or not abortion is available to people. Um, but I do think that we need to figure out how to share spaces. And one of the things that made him decide to talk to me was at the very beginning of the conversation, I said, look, I don't agree with you, but I understand your position. I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to say, this is a murder. And if I thought it was a murder, I'd probably be right next to you on the picket lines. So, so understand that I don't think you're bad or crazy or duped. Um, I, I, I get it. Um, and he later, months later, he said to me, that was, of all the things you said to me, that was the most profoundly um, mind-altering uh, in terms of my view of progressives. That 
um, help me out, so that, that progressives don't, or, or that at least not all progressives, or at least that you, <laughs> as the proxy for progressives there, um, don't assume a mindlessness or a, right, right. A, I mean, a sort of... I mean, if you think about how evangelicals come into contact with us, they come into contact with us through like John Stewart and um, you know the way we treat them in media, and uh, we treat them really quite badly in media. They're invariably the small-minded bigot who won't let the kids dance on campus or those kinds of things. And, and while I laugh as hard as anyone else at Jon Stewart, it is a lot of mockery and a lot of derision. Um, and, and I think that in secular spaces, progressives in particular, there's been a language of real contempt for spirituality. If you listen to Bill Maher talk, if you listen to some of the more popular atheists, and you know, I'm all for people being atheists if that's what they want to be. But, but the way Bill Maher talks, he sounds as bad as an ayatollah in terms of being dismissive of the way everybody else's spiritual understanding is. So, um, I've lost track of your question completely. Well, no, I, I think you <laughs> answered it basically, um, which was how the depictions of evangelicals in popular culture um, by progressives in right. entertainers in popular culture um, right. might lead to some per perceptions. Well, it might hinder understanding, yeah, basically. I mean, I, I'm turning out to be their progressive, that they, I'm the one, so they look at me like a termite under a microscope a lot of the time, <laughs> and they're really shocked when they meet me because I'm not mean, I'm not making fun of them, I'm not snickering, you know, when I slip out to the ladies' room to have a little laugh at their expense, I'm genuinely interested in them. Um, and as a result of that, I think, and, and I'm not completely morally bankrupt. The people on the pro-life side of this are so insular and come into contact so seldom with people who have a different point of view, they've actually persuaded themselves, as we've seen this year, that people sell baby body parts for profit without batting an eye. They really believe that. Um, that comports with their view of how the world works. And so I think it's been really important for me just to kind of walk into these rooms and not be the morally bankrupt person that they assume I'm gonna be. You mentioned uh, belief and, and in that context in the Planned Parenthood um, story. It, what's striking watching, the, another thing that comes up in the film is um, among pastors, among ministers um, who are to varying degrees theologians are certainly versed in the Bible and can, mm -hmm. can and do cite the scripture. Um, what they will then interchange or what you will hear is talking points um, often used in the gun debate. Um, repeated, it becomes clear when like said from scripture. a religious, like scripture, yes. as articles of faith. Yeah. And how, and I think we, or at least I had thought of, um, again, as, a, as just an ideological debate, um, but there seems to be perhaps something that a, a, a person of faith um, going along with their religious faith is a, it becomes a faith in, in guns and the power of guns and what is said about guns. Yeah. Yeah. by you know by the gun lobby well i think in the in the in the silence the deafening silence from religious leaders people have not had anyone to talk to about when to pull the gun out and why to pull the gun out and where to keep the gun should it be on top of the fridge or whatever um and the nra has been the only voice that they trust um for talking about guns and so and, and rob actually did a poll of all his supporters um, and all his pastors. Where do you go, where do you look to find authoritative information about guns? And they said Fox News and the NRA, you can hear it in the film. Mm -hmm. um, that's where they get all their information and you know, you can hear Fox News in everything everybody says. So it's, it's, it's a calcified relationship, it needs to be broken down, but, but, but people are like um, increasingly kind of realizing that they were not looking at the Bible for this, that the Sermon on the Mount is very clear. Uh, you know, one of the things they do invariably is say Luke 22, 36. I'm getting really good at this scripture thing. <laughs> and in Luke 22, 36, uh, it's, it's Gethsemane. They're going to take him, Jesus, to crucify him. Peter pulls out a sword and cuts off a Roman soldier's ear. Um, and, uh, and, and Jesus says, put that sword away. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's, that's what leads up to this. And then he says, okay, you guys will be traveling. You're not gonna have my protection anymore. If you don't have a soul, sword, sell your cloak and buy a sword. So, well, first of all, 
a sword as a stand-in for a gun is a very, very <laughs> iffy proposition. And you know, we with that guy in the bar, we had a long conversation about whether a knife was as deadly as a gun, and it was so disingenuous and stupid. Um, but anyway, beyond that, beyond that, they always, always cite Luke 2236 as justification. He's saying you should protect yourself. He's saying you should have a gun. But Luke 2238, I didn't, I didn't bother to go look at the, at the, at the lines because I just took it on faith. They were telling me something that was true, and then I decided to go look at it in context. Luke 2238 says, G Peter tells him, I already have a sword. Um, in fact, I have two. And Jesus says, Oh well, don't get any more. That's enough. It's a gun control <laughs> scripture. <laughs> All this time. So uh, that, is, that is the only verse in the Bible that they have in support of what they think. I mean, in the New Testament, rather. Old Testament, obviously, there's plenty of material there. But, but in the New Testament, they've got one verse to go to, one. And I've heard it from every single one of them. That's how I know that's the only one. Because if there were another one, they would have told me it by now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take that, and stand that against the enormity and the repetition of the Sermon on the Mount, it is astonishing. One of the things Rob says is that if you want to read the Bible, you got to read it against yourself. You have to read the Bible against yourself. You don't go looking in the Bible for a reason to continue doing what you're doing. And, and when he says that, I've seen him in, in services, when he says that, you can feel the whole place stop and say, oops, yeah, you're right. I have two more questions for you, and then we'll open it up to the audience. There are microphones you'll see on both sides, so just get your questions ready, and then we'll just go, I don't know, we'll start on the right, or my right and the left, <laughs> um, to be, uh, I don't know, unpredictable about it. Um, so I want to also talk a little bit about Lucia McBath, um, the other major figure in the film, um, and she talks about recognizing that this is now her life's work. Um, for her, very emotional. I mean, you know, the connection to it is is deeply, wholly personal, um, and it's not easy um, for her. She, both in the trial of Jordan Davis, and then as she goes and testifies, and all the work that she does, she's juggling two jobs, you know, through most of it, um, and then back to Reverend Shank, who, you know, goes to his, as he calls, focus groups, and is just met with, you know. Yeah deep skepticism at best. Um, you've spent a lot of time with both. Where does the optimism mm -hmm. for them come from, that right. they are able to get up right. in the face of frustration yeah. for Lucia, rejection for okay. Shank? Where does that come from? Well, it's a very simple question that answers itself, faith. <laughs> faith. It's hard not to be an optimist if what you really feel is faith. And um, you know, Rob has studied this, studied this, studied this. He's looked into the darkest part of his heart, and he he's really believes he's right. So he goes forward. Lucy experienced the worst thing any person can be asked to experience, and she lives in hell every day. I mean, not in hell. That doesn't go with the faith narrative, but right. nevertheless. You know, I mean, the suffering, uh, it's just not like anything I've ever seen. And if it weren't for her faith, I don't know where she'd be. It's certainly driven many people to suicide and drug abuse and so forth. Um, her, the, it strengthened her faith going through this. Um, and it, I think it's almost like she thinks like God was there and she was here and then everything between her and God got stripped away when Jordan died. And she feels like she's directly speaking what God is asking her to say. Um, and, and, you know, she knows that um, that this, the openness of this wound is, a, is of benefit socially. She knows that her, if she speaks and shows her suffering, people change. But she's been threatened. Her life has been threatened. She's been harassed. She, she's been, you know, called racist names. And, you know, it's astonishing how people in this community treat activists on this subject. But um, she has no doubt, none. Um. When did you start work on the film exactly? Uh, 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 that's a good question. 2013. So 2013. And since um, it came out officially at the right end of Sandy October, Hook, right after Sandy Hook. Hook. Yeah. Um, so and, right at, and, and the movie comes out right at the end of October. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, we've had <laughs> the Planned Parenthood shooting. We've had San Bernardino. Um, 
this year defined as, when you define mass shootings as four or more victims, whether that's a fatal or non-fatal, um, 42 in 52 days. Mm -hmm. um, just had another one over the weekend. Um, where do you come down? And, and, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who was already involved and active in the issue before the film, and the film grows mm -hmm. out of that, um, are you more or less optimistic oh, more. now? I, I'm so optimistic I can feel things turning. They really are turning. We invited 12 of the most conservative pastors in Southern California to dinner, um, and we signed non-disclosure agreements. And this is dear San Bernardino, so um, it was very raw for people. Um, they came at 5.30, they stayed till 10.30 talking about this issue. Five hours of the most right-wing evangelical pastors you'll ever meet, because that's how troubled they are. They know they have a problem on their hands. They know their people have gotten out of control and that, that, that this doesn't make sense at any level. So I'm not optimistic that I'm gonna get what I want. You know, unicorns will fly and candy canes will rain from heaven. That would be nice. I'd love to have all the guns get melted in a fire and we'll make a nice, you know, giant plowshare out of them. But I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, so I like to live on the real planet. And, and on the real planet, I think what needs to happen is a deep, soul searching, uh, coming to conscience on this issue. Because I believe in my heart, if we come at this from our consciences, we will come to very different conclusions from a legislative point of view. Thank you. Um, questions now from the audience. Hi, um, Mary Watson, executive dean here at the New School. Um, First, I want to say thank you for a very provocative and interesting film, really a fantastic um, undertaking. Congratulations. And I want to um, connect it back to the Pray the Devil Back to Hell uh, film that you did a few years ago. Yeah. I guess it was 2008. Um, and I think that was, at least in my understanding of your history, a real turning point. So I wonder how you connect your current work mm. about the role of women in bringing about peace and justice mm. with your own family legacy and the way in mm. which you know, your, your father and grandfather and others worked in film to, to, to sort of advance the role of women in society. So I wonder what the connection yeah. is. Well, the Disney thing always comes back and bites me in the ass one way or the <laughs> other. <laughs> um, I, you know, honestly, when Pray the Devil Back to Hell opened, that, that's a film about Liberian women and the end of the Civil War there, and they really were amazing in terms of their activism, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it really has a big upswing at the end. It kind of ends on a really powerful, optimistic note. And when we were sitting in our very first big audience in Tribeca, I looked over at Ginny, my partner, and said, oh my God, we made a Disney movie. <laughs> I just had no idea. <laughs> um, so by, quite by accident, um, I'm, I'm an optimist. I believe in the good of human nature. I really believe if, 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 you know, if people rise, the best things will happen. Um, but you have to ask them to rise. And that's kind of what Disney films are. Um, so while I go around sometimes apologizing for all the things we know are there in the history of the company and my name, um, well, it's actually called Joe McCarthy and said, may I please testify? He did. He really did. Mm -hmm. And you could find him. He, he doesn't just name names. He spells them out. Um, so there's that. But, um, but I feel incredibly proud that I was able to reach into the the best part of what I came from and live on that. Thank you for what you're doing, it's great. Thanks. Hey. Hi, uh, I'm Ken Cassell, I'm just a community member. Um, I was struck by a couple of things, uh, but most of all by the power of dialogue, mm. which I think takes a certain amount of courage to engage in, particularly yeah. with people who hold such radically different point of views, yeah. as you clearly do, and, and you said a little bit about what it was you did to develop the capacity to hear somebody mm. who felt like they had horns. Mm. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because my sense is that as much as you were documenting his evolution, you were also part of his evolution. Mm. Uh, and I think he of yours yes. as well. So I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what that uh, what that interface feels like. So you're in the Department of Psychology, are you? Uh, I'm a clinical social worker. I specialize <laughs> okay. in infant mental Close health. And I'm a Buddhist teacher. <laughs> no, but you're right. You're no, absolutely you, right. By the way, the office that he occupies, 
I think used to be the headquarters for the Methodist funded coalition to stop funding the war right across from oh, the Supreme wow. Court. I volunteered there a long time wow. ago, so it was funny to see that. Oh, but please, back funny. to the dialogue part, <laughs> it's very interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, um, I, as I said, I think it's incredibly courageous to be willing to change on camera. Um, honestly, I, I had lost my parents kind of quickly, one after the other in the couple of years leading up to me starting this film. And I didn't know it until I was well into it that I was looking for a way back to them too, because it was hard to have big, deep political differences. It, it's not fun. I didn't enjoy it. Um, and my mother was a deeply spiritual, faithful woman. Um, and you know, I've tried to find my way back that, to that a million ways um, and never quite found my way back to that. And so what, what happened as we started this film is that you know, that first meeting was, was weird, but almost immediately we actually realized we thought in very, we thinked, thought in very similar ways. Um, and all of a sudden this friendship formed and it was the craziest thing. Um, so like right before I came up here, I got a text from him. We, we text all the time, like we're like girlfriends, chattering girlfriends. <laughs> it's the strangest thing because we have a real, real rapport with each other. It's very interesting. So we're actually thinking of writing a book about it um, because we're both as surprised as anybody else would be. Um, so he arrived at his politics a lot in the same way I arrived at mine and from the same motivations. So how do you land in opposite places when you start from a place you know, I don't understand that, and I and I want to take it apart and understand it. But but I think it also contains if we can take this apart, maybe the answer to the way back. I mean, because I really believe, like, we're never going to arrive at a place where everybody in America believes abortion is murder, and therefore we have a law and everybody agrees with it, and there's no problem. And we're never going to arrive at a time where everybody's fine with abortion, and they aren't going to bother the people who are giving abortions or getting abortions. That's just never going to happen. Um, so we have a per permanent conflict that is unresolvable. And what I know about you know, perpetual conflict or, or um, insoluble conflict is you, you choose to inhabit the conflict differently. You start to understand the conflict as the ground you live on and not, you're not fighting to get to some ideal space on the other side of it. And once you make that mental shift, then the ground rules change and everybody becomes a little more civilized, I think. And that was how I chose to inhabit a relationship with him um, and, and, and he with me. And because of that, we've had some very interesting conversations on the question of choice. And he would occasionally kind of show up when we were getting ready to shoot and say, you know, I just read stories online about women who had abortions before it was legal. Um, he went out and started looking for information he'd never been privy to before, and, and so did I. So, I, I'm in church on Sunday, I can't believe it. Um, I found the goofiest, hippiest, gayest church you can find, but I'm in church on Sunday, and mm -hmm. I can't believe I look forward to Sunday. Go figure, you can knock me over with a feather. <laughs> this is Pro Parker, an, an alumnus of the New School. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed the film, thank, uh, thank you for that. Uh, but uh, but uh, this uh, issue, when evangelical got involved, they, they complicated the issue, which was basically a constitutional issue and a legal issue. Mm -hmm. It would have been taken care of at that level. Mm -hmm. Any time evangelicals get involved, mm -hmm. they complicate everything, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> and they are citing the Bible. Mm -hmm. they are, they're quoting the Bible to justify what is basically a right to commit violence. Mm -hmm. And what way are they different from the ISIS? which is uh, mm -hmm. chanting Quranic prayers right. before they behead. Right. I don't want to compare them to that, but yeah. again, yeah. here they are advocating violence. If they believe in the, in the Bible, they should be advocating showing the other cheek. Right, right. So, you know. Well, I, I would, uh, yeah. I actually think it's fair to compare them to ISIS in the sense that the vast majority of Muslim people are peace-loving yeah, people. That's right. And the vast majority of evangelicals are also peace-loving people. You'd be very surprised. We have a narrow minority of evangelicals who make a lot more noise and seem a lot bigger and louder and more powerful than they really are. 
And those are the people who mess with our politics. And honestly, if they had never become evangelicals, they would be a problem in some other way. The, the guy in the, they would. <laughs> the, the guy who's the loudest in the scene with the four of them at the restaurant is named Troy Newman. He's the current head of Operation Rescue. He's named in the Planned Parenthood lawsuit. He is the head of the organization that did the secret tape recordings and so forth. And, and so he knowingly created the perception among his own people that was false, that Cecile Richards is killing and selling babies. And I, I have said to him, if she dies, I swear to God, if somebody kills her, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> I'm sorry for the language. <laughs> but I hold you personally responsible for that. Um, I have a, he's only one of these people that I've dealt with that I have a real problem with. And, and honestly, if he weren't an evangelical, He's, he's, a, he's a disturbed person. He's not a normal person. No, I'm not. He, he keeps an AR-15 in the back of his car, and he calls it Mama. So yeah, things did not go well for him at home. <laughs> so so I, it's, a, it's an apt comparison, because I think the evangelicals get denigrated, and we assume the worst of them. All I found in those churches were really good people who might have incredibly different ideas about the world that mostly came from how um, hermetically sealed their communities were. And I really believe that for the most part, if they would just open up their communities and understand us and other in a slightly different way, they'd be very different people. Yeah. The other is a sinner, always. Yeah, yeah. We preach on behalf of God. Yeah. The other person is evil, so it's better to eradicate him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm a new school student, and uh, thank you for the film. Um, I wanted to ask on a technical note, um, that scene with the four uh, people sitting at the table, uh, I was just curious how you went about uh, presenting the camera to uh, not your main characters, but to the other folks, and just trying to that balance, uh, trying to balance the role of the camera in mm -hmm. front of uh, a lot of people that uh, I guess don't have that experience and, yeah. and d just playing the balance between people like acknowledging that the camera's there yeah. and trying to shoot a scene right. uh, as real, I guess. Right, I, I think a lot of the success of that scene is because Rob had the trust of the other people in that shot. Um, there were actually behind the camera, there were like 20 people watching us shoot that. So it, it should have felt really staged and it wasn't because Rob had a real natural feeling by that point. I mean, if you watch, if you know which interviews are earlier and which ones are later, you'll, you can see he really got used to the camera and became very natural over the course of the film. Um, but uh, he, all, he had really the trust of his colleagues. These are people he's known for 30 years. And so they were willing to, to risk that. They, Troy pulled out and decided to participate and then he pulled out again. So he wasn't really sure um, and he was definitely on edge, and you could feel his edge, but that actually makes him a better, um, he makes him a better character. So we had one camera locked down, and that's that really blown out shot with the cranberry juice, which I just love that shot. And then we just had one camera um, moving, and that was it. And he, you know, he made the kit as small as the rig as small as he could make it, non obtrusive. And he, I, my my shooter was just this brilliant, brilliant, amazing guy. He could really be unobtrusive the way he would move around. Um, but they all just got so deep. Evangelical ministers are show people. I mean, this is show business. So they're not intimidated by a camera, really. They're, they're happy, delighted to be on camera. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. aspect of this um, it sounds like when you started when you started the, the film you didn't really know what to expect you were searching for some a story to yeah. tell right yeah. so I'm also curious about how did you facilitate the meeting between Rob and Lucille or how did that come about yeah yeah um, yeah so that's the thing about verite filmmaking is you know you kind of start with a character and this is either a story it's not a story and you have no way of knowing it's terrifying way to make films um, so we, for a long time, thought this was going to be a story about how Rob Shank gets interested in guns, everybody hates him, and he chickens out. <laughs> End of story. Um, so we were making a film with Lucy at the same time, and it was kind of moving in parallel lines. We didn't know where Lucy's story was going either. 
Um, but it just, the, they spoke in the same language. They understood the world in the same way. And honestly, Rob stopped stopping answering my messages the day he met Lucy. I mean, you can really see on his face. He's like, oh God, <laughs> I have no choice now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and and we, we knew we were onto something once we put them together. You know, it, was, it felt to me like really uh, disingenuous not to say the filmmaker put them together. Um, but you know, you, you've got a fourth wall and you can break it if you want to break it. That's a conscious and stylistic decision, but you can't just break it once. Um, that's, that's incompetent. <laughs> so if we weren't going to break it more than once, we had to kind of fudge that a little bit. So she, we looped a line with her saying, my friend introduces it. And it's true, we're friends. So <laughs> I always hate that moment mm -hmm. because I know it's a little disingenuous, but it seemed like the greater good was in holding true to the fourth wall. Abigail, I just yeah, want to say, cool. hey, how are you? <laughs> On behalf of the New School, thank you for coming out tonight and bringing this film to us. We thank really you. appreciate it. James, thanks for your role as well. And for all of you, thank you for coming and uh, have a great evening.